Okay, we're going to call the uh, Senate Transportation Committee meeting to order for Monday, April 8th, 2024. The time is 3.06 p.m. We are on 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building on Eclipse Day. And the quorum is present. Members, we have six bills on the agenda today. Um, the first bill we're hearing from Senator McEwen, uh, we will refer to the Judiciary Committee. The rest will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus supplemental finance bill. Uh, and I had one more thing I was going to say, and I forgot what it was. But we'll just get rolling, and if I remember, I'll get back to it. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so we, uh, um, the Senate DFL caucus has been called into a caucus meeting at five, so we're gonna try really hard to get there. So, Senator Zinsky's like, good luck with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know you well enough now. We've been together long enough. I know how to read you, Senator Zinsky. Well, we'll try, we'll try. And uh, yeah, I know that we're gonna have a lot to talk about on one of the bills in particular, but we're gonna work it out. All right, with that, um, we will start with Senator McEwen, who's at the table. Welcome to your committee, Senator McEwen, Senate File 4939. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, before I begin discussion about um, the Senate file before the committee, I have an A1 amendment. So Senator McEwen offers the A1 amendment. This is an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. It's my pleasure today to present Senate File 4939 as amended. Um, members, it, as I understand it, this bill uh, originates uh, from a judge in Carleton County and out of concern that those participating in treatment court are sometimes not uh, allowed to have a driver's license because of some of the issues that they have been facing in the court system. They'll have a suspended license. Um, however, treatment courts, and particularly um, treatment courts that are um, in effect in greater Minnesota, where we don't have often access to adequate transit, a, a treatment court participant has a number of requirements that they have to abide by um, that can include inpatient uh, substance use disorder treatment, outpatient treatment, attending court uh, weekly, reporting for probation, usually at least twice a week, uh, completing drug tests as required, and attending um, usually at least two recovery service activities a week. So there's just a lot of uh, activity that goes along with participating in drug courts and treatment courts. And um, we want to make sure that those people who are um, in those treatment courts are actually able to get where they need to be uh, to abide by the conditions that the court is setting and to be successful in their participation with that tre treatment court. So what the Senate file as amended would do, it would establish a process for the Department of Public Safety to issue a limited driver's license for those undergoing treatment court in particular. Um, if an individual tests positive for relapsed drug use or is terminated from the treatment court, the court and DPS can suspend the license. So this is just another tool that the courts can employ. Again, this was brought to us by a judge in Carleton County asking for just some help, a little, a little uh, uh, additional way for their participants to be successful. And with that, members, I would stand for questions. Uh, thank you, Senator McEwen. Um, all right, we will uh, first ask, uh, I'm not sure if we have, uh, Ms. Boyd, we don't have a fiscal note. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's correct. There was a fiscal note completed for the DPS section, but it was decided that the court should also be added to that fiscal note, so it was pulled back and it's being revised currently, but there, I, I can say that the DPS note was completed and there were no costs in the DPS fiscal note. Right. We talked about this last week. Now I remember. Um, and then we talked about this 10 minutes ago. So yeah, I'm really I'm doing great here. Um, so with that, um, before we get to member questions, I will ask if anyone would like to step forward and testify on Senate File 4939. Okay. Seeing none. Uh, members, questions? 
Oh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And not that I'm a big proponent of this, but uh, is there any requirement for, as I read it, I didn't see any, a requirement for interlock or anything like that. Is there any such requirement, or is that something that's left up to the courts? Senator McKeown. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you for that question. Senator Howe, I think um, if interlock is a requirement, usually the way that it happens in the courts is uh, depending on the level of severity of the uh, crime that a, a person is accused of committing and if they're in a, a treatment court, usually they're working toward, um, they make a, uh, an ad admission oftentimes uh, of of guilt and uh, for a crime, depending on what that level is, it might be a requirement of their participation in the treatment court that they do have an ignition interlock. But depending on the level, it might not it also be something that is required. So um, oftentimes it is, um, but it is is sort of an independent decision by a judge and probation officers whether that it, that requirement in particular is part of the requirements of their participation in the treatment court. Not for the participant. The license issue is is really just a separate issue than whether or not they have to have an ignition interlock. Senator Help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I always had looking at the the conditions of this issuance, I just would have thought that that's would have been a perfect place to put a requirement like that in there. But uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave that go. But I would have thought that, it, you know, the conditions of issuance, that would have been a perfect place to put that uh, the requirement for an interlock. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howell. Senator McCune. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, forgot to note as well that I mean, depending on the substance that a person is having um, uh, difficulty with, uh, the ignition interlock might be something that makes sense because it might be alcohol or it might be a type of substance that it, ignition interlock has no interaction with because the testing for ignition interlock doesn't interact with their substance that they're having a problem with. Thank you. Members, questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not in favor of this bill, but I just want to, one of my concerns, and, and I think uh, my representative, uh, Petersburg, also brought it up, and, and the concern I have is if uh, the incentive is lost to complete the program, so this can get stretched out. So I think uh, what I understand is before, you'd have to complete your program before you get your license back, and this is going to allow it a license to have it while you're doing it and so the incentive to complete the program isn't as quite as much as it used to be uh, that you could stretch this out for a while you can continue on to other things to, to continue to get your license I think it's it's taking that away and and it's taking part of the personal responsibility of you know I think it's just becoming a theme of, of weakening the penalties for for crimes committed and so I'm not going to be in favor of it but thank you mr. chair Thank you. Senator McKeown. Mr. Chair, I'd like to request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. All right. Anything and further, members? Mr. Chair, I would just note that um, I think getting somebody getting their life back is a pretty good incentive. And I, and I, I would note that those of us who don't live in the metro area um, and who live in an area where I, I just... I'll, I'll, I'll be happy. I'll bring this back to the judges who brought this uh, in Carleton County and, and said that this is, a, is something that they'd like to see. Um, because it is literally impossible for some people participating in treatment court to be able to meet their requirements. And some of the judges are finding themselves sort of ordering uh, uh, a participant to commit an illegal act by driving with a su suspended license in order for them to meet the conditions of their treatment court. So that's, that's a real problem that we have to fix. It's not, it's not like the person is doing all of these requirements, all of these things that they're required to do throughout their week, throughout their lives, so they can get their license back. They're doing it so that they can get their life back. And so this, this is a tool. This is not the prize at the end of the work. I just want to make it real clear. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Members, anything further on Senate File 4939? Seeing none, uh, Senator McCune, would, would you like to move your bill? Um, it needs to be referred to judiciary. So moved. So Senator McCune moves Senate File 4939 be recommended to pass as amended. 
uh, and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. And a roll call has been requested. So if the clerk could please take the roll. Chair Double? Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Senator Herr? Senator Howe? Yeah. Senator Lang? No. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Herr? Uh, there being uh, five yes votes and four no votes, the motion uh, passes and the bill will be referred. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, members are going to go slightly out of order because judiciary. Yes, to judiciary. Um, so um, members, we're going to go slightly out of order uh, and uh, invite Senator Kroon, who's with us, uh, to come up and present Senate File 4813. Welcome to the committee, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to present Senate File 4813. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, an A3 amendment and also an A4 amendment to that A3 amendment. All right, so um, we'll allow a moment for the A4 to come around to accompany the A3. And the A3 is a DE. So Senator Jasinski would like to move the A3. Delete everything amendment, which is in your packets. So moved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries and has the A4 made it around. Uh, Senator Jasinski moves the A4 amendment to the A3 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill uh, actually came to me from my constituent, uh, Nancy Kaiser, who lives in Blaine. Uh, but she winters in Arizona. And she went to renew her driver's license last December before she went to Arizona for the rest of the winter. And she was not told at the time, nor was she aware, that her driver's license could not be forwarded in the mail. And uh, when she was down in Arizona wondering where her driver's license was, she contacted DVS to ask, and they said they couldn't forward the driver's license. And then that started a kind of a, uh, a complicated process for her to get her driver's license that required paperwork and affidavit, additional fees, et cetera. So she contacted me to ask, I don't know if there's a way that we could change the law, the law to make it easier for um, snowbirds like her to renew her driver's license. And um, that's how this bill started out, Mr. Chair. It creates a temporary mailing address option when renewing your driver's license, where if the applicant select it, selects that option, DVS will send your driver's license to that temporary mailing address. This streamlines the process, makes it easier uh, to elect this option which right now the process is limited, confusing, and not very well known. So this will come in handy for many snowbirds in our state who need to have their driver's license sent down south when they renew. Um, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the DE part of this, the addition to the original bill, is uh, really uh, an exciting bill, or at least I think it's exciting, and I hope you all will as well. But it, it creates an opportunity for um, the uh, non-compliant and real ID uh, applicants to renew their driver's license uh, online, essentially, effectively, uh, every other time uh, with certain requirements. Uh, the requirements before you can uh, renew your uh, driver's license online, there'd be no material change to your identity, uh, that you're not renewing a different type of license, uh, and. DVS must have a photo on file of you that's not older than five years. Um, and then uh, 
the, the vision part, uh, Mr. Chair, has changed in the A4. Uh, that says that you have to have a vision certification uh, that's not more than two years old. Um, and then the rest, the remainder of the DE, Mr. Chair, um, is a reporting requirement that um, uh, the, the, the agency would submit a report to the chairs and ranking members of the transportation committees um, to uh, provide some, uh, first of all, to uh, uh, summarize and uh, report on how this is affecting um, how this is working out, and then also to come up with some <coughs> ideas and suggestions on how to expand uh, online renewals of driver's license. The A4 also then would create um, or would have the report include some ideas on some uh, fee sharing between the commissioner and the deputy registrars. I know that that's a sensitive subject, and um, this would give the legislature some ideas to plan for the future and um, to address that issue while we continue to move forward in a way that I think the public wants to see us move forward. So uh, that's a basically a summary of, of the DE, Mr. Chair. I think online renewal of driver's license, it's, it's not really, from my perspective, it's not really a question of if, it's a question of when. Uh, I think this is a responsible and reasonable step towards making people's lives a little bit easier and more convenient without com compromising safety. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, I will stand for questions. Well, thank you, Senator Cruen. Um, before we go to questions and or testimony, I'll ask Ms. Boyd um, to help us understand the fiscal note and whether we have a sense of whether this fiscal note um, remains intact in light of the DE. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, yeah, there are significant changes in the A3 and further in the A4 that will will request a new fiscal note after engrossment of the new language. Um, the original fiscal note um, had minimal costs, absorbed costs from in-drive programming, which will likely still be intact um, in the new language, and then some printing costs to update an application um, of $11,000 one time. Um, I'm unclear if uh, recategorizing the types of mailing addresses will change those needs, but we'll get a new fiscal note on this as soon as possible. Great. Thank you. Um, and also, before we go to questions, I will ask to see if uh, anyone would like to testify on Senate File uh, 4813. Um, I actually uh, would like perhaps to hear from the agency um, if they have anything to share. The basic question as you come forward, Director Zhang, is um, does, does this bill work? Uh, with the, you know, under the A3 as, as amended by the A4 um, from your perspective. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division, and uh, this bill is administrable uh, by DVS. Uh, the MinDrive system is, as you know, much more sophisticated than our previous product, and um, this would be something that uh, we think that the technology can uh, adapt, be adapted for. All right, why don't you just stay put there in case there are member, other member questions. Uh, members, questions? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Director Zhang. Uh, how would this work with uh, military members that are, are deployed or are not in the state? Would this actually help them as they work through this process? Director. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe. Military, uh, well, military member, active duty military members have a different carve out for their credential. And so um, the way that would work, I believe, and I'm creeping out of my expertise here a bit, um, um, but I believe the way that that works is that they can maintain their expired credential as, with their active duty uh, credentials and they can drive around uh, with that until they're able to renew their credential upon return to the state of Minnesota. Um, but this would, it, to in general, would, would apply to all credentials across uh, the, the ecosystem in which every credential would be eligible for an online renewal as long as they meet the requirements of the photo and the vision test. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, uh, Commissioner, you, you did nail that. that. That is truly how it works. But when it comes time for uh, those of us that have that expired 
driver's license on active duty, rental car agencies don't take that. So that's why it behooves us to actually keep them active and uh, updated because uh, uh, having that uh, experience when I was trying to rent a car in, in Italy with a, an expired driver's license and my military ID, that did not work. So it, having this uh, as an option to maintain that would be a, a, a big asset. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you. Uh, members, questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Kroon for bringing this forward. I was a, a co-author on the bill originally as it was intended for the uh, snowbirds or the, the uh, renewals and the secondary address, uh, but after the bill has kind of changed forms, uh, my concern is the deputy registers, and, and I've made that voice to you and I've taken my name off the bill. Uh, my concern is deputy registers are losing uh, income as we speak. Uh, you know, it seems to be getting pushed online. And what happens is the simple transactions go online, and the more difficult ones, you have to go to your neighborhood uh, deputy register. And if they lose all the money from the, the easier transactions, it's tougher for them to stay in business. And if that happens over a prolonged period, we're going to lose those very, very valuable deputy registers as DVS and DPS has testified for the last uh, eight years since I've been here. Um, and we've tried to fee sharing. Uh, for many, many years, and the, the department is opposed, uh, animately opposed against that. So uh, you can do a study, but I know what the report's going to be already is because the department is against it. So that's my concern is the study is great to show what it is, but I think if we lose these deputy registers in, in our state, we're doing our citizens a, dis, a disservice because they rely on deputy registers to go in and get these things because sometimes they're very complicated. They often start something online, run into an issue, and then they have to go down to their local deputy register. Then they lose that money because the deputy register wants to help them out, but they don't get a fee for doing that. So that's my concern with the bill. Um, I, I know I voiced that to you, and I just want to make sure we have that discussion because I think we really need to look at that because if bills like this go, they're going to lose 50% of the revenue because, uh, not of the total revenue, but 50% for a person because they can do it online. Um, so I, I have some concern over that. I like oh, the essence of what you're doing. I like the, 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 uh, for the snowbirds that are down in Florida or Arizona or wherever they may be to be able to renew it. But my concern is the overall system with what's going to happen with our deputy registers. And I think we really need to keep that in mind because we're seeing it more and more. I just got my license tab renewal for my truck uh, the other day, and it's almost like they're advertising to go online because they put a fee what it could be to do it online, and they do a fee what it could be to your deputy registers. And, and we added that uh, uh, convenience fee uh, to go to your deputy registers to be able to do that. But I never expected the department to basically advertise, and, and that's what's happening right now. You're advertising for people to go online. Uh, when we first went out with FAST, uh, there was a, a, a question at the thing, uh, at the deputy register when they're renewing their license, would you like to have future ones done online? And, and they're pushing it more and more online. And, and our deputy registers just can't handle it. They've been through enough with the transition uh, from MinLars to FAST, which is great now, or MinDrive, but these deputy registers are hanging on by a thread right now. And if we're going to further reduce the time or that people are going to go into the local deputy register to do this, we're going to hurt our system, we're going to hurt the service to our Minnesotans, and a lot of people can't go online. They're either senior or for some reason they can't go online, and, and they prefer to do it in person. And if these deputy registers go away, then they're not going to be able to do it. And in, in the small picture, it seems simple. In the larger picture, we're, we're diminishing what our deputy registers are doing for our citizens of the state. Thank you. Chair. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that, Senator Jasinski. I, I am not insensitive to uh, the implications of this to the deputy registrars, and I know that the department is opposed to fee sharing. Um, I certainly don't want to do anything to put the deputy registrars out of business, um, and I, as I've shared with, with you before, I don't live in this committee. I just wander into it every once in a while, and I know that this is a um, kind of a historical um, point of contention. It seems to me, however, that um, those issues can be addressed um, through a mechanism other that wouldn't prevent um, progress in giving the people of Minnesota what they want, which is the ability to renew their driver's license online as long as it doesn't compromise public safety. And so um, that, that is the reason for the A4 and why I put that new part in there
to uh, evaluate proposals to institute fee sharing um, between the commissioner and the deputy registrars. And I understand the commissioner doesn't like that, but from my perspective as kind of a partial outsider to this world, that seems like it's inevitable, just like online renewal is inevitable as well. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Yeah, Mr. J just to follow up, and, and I would love the department to be open to online or fee sharing, I should say. And if they could do that, I'd be totally supportive because I think that's really what it takes is that it's got to be a partnership. And I sat through many summer, uh, summer of meetings uh, when we had our task force on this. And, you know, if you look at the overall system of things work, uh, if they had fee sharing, it would work tremendously. But I've just listened for four years after that, they're up adamantly opposed against it. So it's nice to ask for the study, but I already know what their answer is going to be is they don't want to do it. So it's been pretty black and white of what they've said uh, on, you know, in their letters that it's, it, they're not going to support it. So that's my concern is if they would be open to it, I would love it. But I, I just know they're not open to it, and, and that's the unfortunate part. Uh, then They're not open to it. I have some creative ideas, which I'm going to talk to you about later. So just Happy two, to do that, Mr. I have Chair. two brand new ideas that occurred to me in the context of this conversation, but uh, I'll talk to you about them as we start moving towards the omnibus bill. Uh, Senator Herp. Yes, uh, and Mr. Chair, um, I, th I, I would like to hear your new idea, not today, but I'm thinking that you, you probably have a great <laughs> idea. You probably have two ideas. I just want to express the same, same concern, same, t same sentiment as uh, Senator Jasinski because we have all this uh, DNV out there supposed to help people. So she, fee sharing could be a possibility that we can promote growth online as well as location. So I just thought I'd add my statement, and I think uh, Senator Jasinski already uh, spoke in great length for it already. No need to be redundant, but just that I'm aligned with him. All right. So um, I want to formally ask if there's anyone else who would like to testify on Senate File 4813. Please make your way forward. Mr. Hurst. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for the record, my name is Jim Hurst. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Deputy Registrars Association. Uh, I'll keep my comments very brief, understanding uh, the tight time frame that you have. Uh, quite honestly, uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski. You basically have already spoken to the uh, concerns that we have in regards to this. Certainly, uh, Senate File 4813, as introduced, we had no problems with, it made sense. But with the adoption of the A3 amendment, uh, we have serious problems with it. And I'm sorry, the A4 amendment does not uh, uh, do it justice. Uh, quite honestly, if this were to take effect in October and then a report comes out from the department in, in February, uh, quite honestly, yes, we know what the report is going to say. They are adamantly opposed to fee sharing. And that gets to the crux of this problem. The deputies are struggling. We finally got a, a fee increase enacted last year to help get us uh, out of debt. Uh, we're still struggling, but this will definitely be a, a case example of last year being one step forward, and this would be two, three steps backward. Uh, and with that, I will conclude my remarks, and I will add myself to the list of people that would like to know what might be on your mind as well, Mr. Chairman, in the future on, on, uh, on that issue. Thank you, and I'll certainly uh, take any questions. All right. Any questions for Mr. Hurst? All right. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Hurst. All right. Members, anything further? Any questions, comments, or amendments? All right. So with that, seeing none, final word, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the conversation today. Like I said, I don't want to do anything that would put deputy registrars out of business. I would just like to emphasize that from the public's perspective, this is a little bit of inside baseball, and they are going to demand this progress, whether it's this year or whether it's in future years. And if the stumbling block is fee sharing, but the public also wants to make sure that deputy registrars are there for when they need them. And so at some point, this fee sharing concept or some creative solution from this committee is going to be necessary because we can't hold back progress um, with these online renewals. And uh, 
I'd also, Mr. President, like to thank researcher Dave Frazier for taking this idea and making it into a workable bill, um, invaluable service there. So I'd like to thank Dave and thank you all for your work on this committee. I very much enjoy coming here. Thank you. Not sure if uh, with the, the lead, uh, lead members' uh, comments, if, send, if Mr. Frazier took that as a compliment or as a fact. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate the, the presentation. Uh, with that, we will uh, lay uh, Senate File 4813 as amended on the table for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kroon. All right. We will revert back uh, to the order and go to item number two, Senate File 5099, Senator Morrison. Welcome to your committee, Senator Morrison, Senate File 5099. <clears throat> and um, do we have an amendment to start with? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do have the A1 amendment. Okay, is that in our packets? All right, Senator Morrison moves the, oh, here it is. Uh, A1 amendment is in your packets, members. Um, so author's amendment, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 5099 as amended. Last year, as you recall, we passed meaningful and responsible legislation addressing transportation greenhouse gas emissions, our number one source of greenhouse gases in Minnesota. The backdrop to this policy is that we have a statewide goal of getting to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and to do so, MnDOT has a goal of reducing vehicle miles traveled per capita by 20% by 2050. The Climate Smart Transportation Policy we passed last year requires that after February 2025, if there is a significant capacity expansion project on the MnDOT system that will increase greenhouse gas emissions or vehicle miles traveled, then that increase must be offset. So in priority order, that offset can be within the project itself or from another project in the same community or within a, a historically disadvantaged community or somewhere else in the region or lastly, somewhere else in the state. The legislation created an impact mitigation working group to work through technical impl implementation considerations. The working group consisted of representatives from MidDOT, city and county officials, city engineers, county engineers, regional planning organizations from the metro and greater Minnesota, and key advocate organizations. They produced a report at the end of January, and this bill is based on recommendations from that report. Um, I want to just start by quoting from that report because it will help as we work through this bill. The working group found that with existing tools and capabilities, basic aspects of the legislation can be implemented. The working group also determined that to fully realize the legislation's effectiveness, a comprehensive and integrated multimodal planning framework should be developed. Transportation investments that reduce emissions and vehicle miles traveled need to be coordinated between cities, counties, metropolitan planning organizations, and MnDOT. So specifically, based on the recommendations from the working group, the bill does the following. It provides a path and a timeline to shift to more of a portfolio approach, so projects are evaluated with respect to the portfolio of projects being planned and less on an individual project basis. It creates a technical advisory committee to help provide ongoing guidance to the technical implementation of the policy. It allows the MnDOT commissioner to implement or change the list of allowable offset actions based on recommendations from the technical advisory committee. It provides funding for the work needed, both for MnDOT and regional planning organizations to enhance modeling tools to support the transition to a portfolio-based approach. And it provides funding for impact mitigation related projects in 2025 and 2026 and preferences this funding for use with projects that reduce traffic fatalities and severe injuries. Uh, so at, with that, Mr. Chair, I will, let's get to our list of testifiers, I think. And I think MnDOT was up first. Mr. Rudine, I believe, was going to testify. Although there seems to be a meeting of the minds between the chair and the ranking minority member. 
Uh, welcome, Mr. Rudine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs. Uh, and uh, yes, actually, a lot of the comments I was going to make have already been made, so I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, but uh, just wanted to give a high-level summary of the work group process uh, that was mentioned. Uh, we actually met starting last June and met uh, every two weeks until February. And so it was a, a pretty big time commitment for, for folks who were involved in that process. Uh, and one of the central themes uh, that, that came out of that process, as was also mentioned, was uh, moving uh, from a, a project by project evaluation to a portfolio or programmatic uh, evaluation. And so um, I want to thank the center for carrying this legislation, which by and large implements the recommendations of the work group and helps us uh, move in the direction of doing that programmatic approach. Uh, so. Um, one of the important pieces of that is uh, building that implement, implementation capacity, uh, so providing resources to MnDOT, uh, as well as um, metropolitan planning organizations and local governments for, uh, for uh, planning emissions, reducing infrastructure, doing the modeling that will be required as part of the analysis, and then uh, eventually uh, assisting with funding to do some of that mitigation or offsetting. And so, um, again, I won't reiterate what's already been said, but I uh, just want to extend my thanks uh, to Senator Morrison for, for carrying the legislation on behalf of the work group and express our support for this legislation. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Rudy? I, mean, I usually don't subject the uh, witnesses to questions, but he's representing the agency. So, um, Senator Howe and then Thank Senator Thank you, Lang. Yeah. Mr. Chair and Mr. Rudine. Uh, how did you know, when they talk about the portfolio, uh, is that a portfolio just for the year or is that a multi-year portfolio? Is that looking at a, you know, a continuation of a road project from, to make sure as you work on a, making it four lanes, like Highway 23, making it four lanes all the way out, that's a portfolio or what all is, what does that all encompass, I guess, when you say portfolio? Mr. Dean. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, uh, yeah, typically it would be, uh, we would do a year-by-year -year analysis. At, so as projects enter into the STIP or the State Transportation Improvement Program, we would be sort of evaluating those projects that are moving into the, the last year of the STIP. And so, um, so every year we would, we would look at projects coming in and other projects that are scheduled and, and see if that moves us in the direction of, of meeting our goals. Uh, and, and if a project comes down, comes into the program that would sort of put us out of meeting those goals, then, then we would look at uh, mitigation or offsetting that would be required. Senator Howell. Senator Lang. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Dean, d simple questions here. Um, does it increase or decrease the cost of roads and bridges in Minnesota? Mr. Rudy. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, if there is uh, offsetting that would be required, that that has the potential to increase the cost of a project. But um, you know, until we go through that analysis, we won't know for certain whether whether offsetting or mitigation will be required. So, uh, okay. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I guess the next question is: I'm not looking at a fiscal note in my package here, and this undoubtedly has a huge fiscal impact, right? I mean, I, I know it's, it's tough to, to figure out what that is, but any idea what we're talking about here, any, uh, throw something at the wall and let us know what's, I mean, you gotta have some idea how much this is gonna cost, right? Uh, Mr. Rudy. Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, so um, the, I think it's important first to note that the, the actual requirements to do this offsetting were enacted last year, and so the, those did have a, a delayed effective date and, and will go into effect in 2025. So I wouldn't say that, that the bill before you today would, would impose those costs. I think it's, it's already in current law. Um, you know, we did hear from the state of Colorado uh, and they were, they've already implemented something very similar. That's what a lot of the legislation from last year was based on. And, and so, you know, they said, uh, my recollection is that they said you know, there, there could be some increased costs on those large expansion type projects. Um, I think they mentioned in the neighborhood of, you know, could be as low as like 10%, could be upwards of, of 20, 
or higher percent, really, de again, depending on what what the impact would be to emissions and vehicle miles traveled, and then what the offsetting uh, mitigation actions would be necessary. Well, and Senator Lang, um, I'll add, um, it, it could also potentially save money because it could drive kinds of mobility improvements and access uh, projects that cost a lot less than large expansion uh, projects when it's deemed that the kind of mobility that's needed in a particular area, in a particular travel, travel shed, um, might not be what the roadway engineers originally contemplated. So I think that's been the experience of other states, is um, it has the potential to save a lot of money, too. I, I don't share your optimism, Mr. Chair. But well, I'm just telling you that's the experience of other right. places. So. Um, so I guess the next question is, and when it comes to 10 to 20 percent possible increases, uh, does that belong in the highway user fund? Well, we're going to get to that conversation shortly. <laughs> okay. So, um, anything? I mean, I'm not trying to cut you no, off. No, that's I mean, fine. That is going to be a conversation that we're going to have in just a minute. Um, so, anything further? All right. Uh, so, why don't we uh, go to? Um, I, I believe from fisc our Senate fiscal staff, we're still awaiting um, the fiscal note itself. All right. Very good. So, uh, stay tuned. We will have that in front of our committee at some point, and then we'll go to the uh, witness. Uh, list here, um, and we'll invite, uh, I believe, remotely, um, Steve Bott, who is representing uh, a couple of organizations. So, welcome to the committee, uh, and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dibble and members. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you and we can see you. Excellent. Thank you for having me here today. Um, as you mentioned, my name is uh, Steve Bott. I'm the uh, City Administrator and Public Works Director for the City of St. Michael here today representing the uh, League of Minnesota Cities and the uh, City Engineers Association. Apologize that I uh, couldn't be with you uh, in person due to a, a conflict. I um, want to thank Senator Morrison for the A1 Amendment, uh, which addressed a lot of uh, the concerns and uh, her cooperation working with our organization uh, to get uh, some of those addressed uh, through that A1 Amendment. Um, one of the things we were very active uh, in participating in that working group uh, which we appreciated and coming out of that, uh, moving to a, the programmatic or portfolio approach that was uh, discussed. Uh, a couple things uh, comment wise from us, uh, we would like to ensure uh, that in that portfolio um, that we're just looking at uh, highway expansion projects, um, got a concern with the way kind of the wording is potentially that it would be all trunk highway projects, let's say a simple uh, mill and overlay uh, type of project um, that uh, that would not have to uh, be subject uh, to these uh, provisions, but understand it uh, to its original intent with the uh, capacity expansion. Uh, also appreciate in the A1 amendment the uh, um, the opportunity to expand the uh, technical uh, advisory committee um, to include potentially um, a couple of um, governmental um, agency uh, members and would, would hope or would ask that uh, potentially someone from the, uh, the city uh, administrators, city engineers, um, League of Minnesota Cities would be uh, one of those members. I think we uh, were able to uh, uh, give good input along with our county partners uh, on uh, that uh, uh, work group and would look to further that with our expertise and uh, unique knowledge of the local system uh, in that uh, technical advisory group. And then the last one, there are some reporting uh, requirements uh, in there uh, with the um, the locals required to uh, to uh, do some data reporting on uh, a local multimodal transportation systems and local project impacts, and we're just uh, looking uh, at what kind of reporting this would entail and a little more background on how um, uh, onerous that would or would not be uh, to some of our our uh, small uh, local cities that uh, don't have a lot of resources. So uh, with that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I thank you for again for allowing the testimony from city engineers and League of Minnesota Cities, and uh, would be open for any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bott. Questions, members? All right, so we go to uh, Joe McPherson from Anoka County. And after Mr. McPherson will be Sam Rockwell from Minnesota. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joe McPherson. I'm the Anoka County Engineer, and today I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota County Engineers Association, 
as well as the Association of Minnesota Counties. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. I appreciate Senator Morrison's opportunity and uh, bringing this forward. This amendment, I think, addresses a lot of the concerns that we as the county and Association of Minnesota Counties had. With that, I'd also like to give a call out to all the members who were on the working group. That was a, a big endeavor to take place over the last six months. I believe we had 12 to 13 meetings and all the partners came in with a variety of different perspectives and ideas when they entered in and I think we all did a really nice job of coming to the table, discussing what the, the issues were and coming up with some rational ideas. With that, I just wanted to call attention to a few items, a few things that I think are a step in the right direction as we move forward in this new era with transportation projects. So a programmatic approach versus a project by project approach. You've heard that from the other presenters today. I think that's the right way to go. Um, we as both agencies feel that that is the right way to go when you start to look at the effects of the project, the benefits of the project and so forth. Also the technical advisory committee, as we move through that working group, that was one of the trends and one of the ideas that really started to show itself very quickly. So we're very supportive of that and um, are happy that that's included in these amendments. Also the additional of the fatal and serious crashes on our roadways, as you're all well aware, we talk about it all the time, is the safety of those traveling on our roads. Whether it's multimodal, it's drivers, it's pedestrians, it's bicyclists, ultimately at the end of the day, that's our main goal is making sure they make it home safe. So we're glad that that was included in here and priorities given to those types of projects that are addressing those types of situations with any funding that's available. Also the reintroduction of the natural systems as another mitigation or offset tool. Uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation there, the, the previous legislation, that was stricken out and then it was added that there was going to be uh, an opportunity for the technical advisory committee to come up with new options. We're glad to see that that was entered back in. A few questions that we had or comments that as we look at these new amendments, one, again, you heard from the previous presenter, Mr. Bott, and that is the related data reporting from local units of government on local multimodal transportation systems and local project impacts on greenhouse gas emissions and VMT. Just wondering what that's gonna look like, how that's gonna shape up. It, it appears as though the commissioner of transportation would be responsible for that, but we just like some clarification on that. Then the second one we had is when it comes to the TAC membership, we understand that the language includes uh, up to four members who are not employees of the state, and up to two of those members would be uh, members of a political subdivision. But we strongly encourage and support having a representative from either the city engineers or the county engineers on that committee, just like we were on the working group. With that, Mr. Chair and committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, thank you, Mr. McPherson. Members, anything for, okay. Uh, I'll invite Sam Rockwell to the table and, uh, and Darren Lee from the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities to the table. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Sam Rockwell. I'm Executive Director of Move Minnesota Action. Uh, thank you, first and foremost, to Senator Morrison for carrying this bill and also just to echo uh, both uh, Mr. McPherson and Dean, the work group, uh, which Move Minnesota was a participant on as well, uh, was a, a, an intense process and a long process, brought together a lot of different perspectives. And I think that this legislation reflects uh, pretty well what came out of that work group and, uh, and that, you know, it's, it's notable that folks who are on kind of either side of this legislation last year are here in support of the bill this year. So Move Minnesota Action is in support of uh, the direction of the bill as well. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that this bill is not actually introducing new targets. The law last year did not introduce new targets for VMT reduction or for climate pollution reduction. Uh, instead, it's about actually reaching those targets, creating tools to actually reach those targets. Um, you know, I think uh, to highlight a couple things, um, uh, from our perspective, uh, we think the portfolio approach also is going in a good direction and considering uh, more than just how highway expansion projects impact our roadways, but how a broader 
portfolio does uh, and how projects interact with each other, which we understand is important for the measurements of vehicle miles traveled in particular, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we think that uh, providing for some data collection to understand how the transportation system as a whole is working, multimodal system as a whole is working, is very important. Uh, we are, our, our goals are statewide goals, greenhouse gas and vehicle miles traveled reduction goals, and so it's important that we not only measure one part of the transportation system, but that we understand how the whole transportation system is uh, reaching or not reaching those goals as we're looking at a piece of it. I think the Technical Oversight Committee uh, providing some accountability and also flexibility in the mitigation options is important. In terms of how this legislation works relative to how the Colorado version works, which we uh, heard from Mr. Radin was, was one of the models for this legislation, we do believe that having some uh, ability to use the HUTD funds for mitigation projects would be important. That is in the first version of the bill that you saw. That's because the way the law is written, we need to be able to, if we have a project that's not reaching our goals, uh, existing state goals, we need to be able to mitigate those uh, goals or the project, or those, uh, those emissions or additional VMT, or the project doesn't move forward. And so in order to have projects move forward, we need to be able to have the funding to create a portfolio that effect effectively pencils out um, with our greenhouse gas and VMT uh, uh, data. So uh, with that, I will uh, thank you all once again and happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, thank you, Mr. Rockwell. Questions? All right, Mr. Lee, welcome. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Darren Lee with Flaherty and Hood here today speaking on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. We're an advocacy organization representing over 100 cities outside of the metropolitan area. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this bill and I also wanna thank you, Chair Dibble, for meeting with me last week and listening to our concerns with this legislation. I also wanna thank the author, Senator Morrison, for meeting with me to discuss her bill and for incorporating some of our suggestions in the A1 amendment. First, I wanna say we agree with the goal of reducing greenhouse gases and acknowledge that in the metro area where an expansion project may occur for capacity reasons, it can induce demand. However, in greater Minnesota, the reason for a highway expansion can be much different, where it's not done to increase capacity or vehicle miles traveled, but for safety and economic reasons. So going back to the last session, when we looked at this original legislation uh, that this bill seeks to modify, it really looked to us like this could be a major obstacle to projects in greater Minnesota. And so that's why we took an active interest in this. Uh, we advocate very strongly for corridors of commerce and other projects in greater Minnesota where safety is a concern with two lane roads, where we see a pattern of severe accidents and going from a two lane to a four lane is needed for safety reasons. Highway 14 is an a great example of this. Uh, and when we asked whether a project like that would be able to move forward, had this legislation been in place at the time, it was unclear. Uh, at a minimum, this would add cost, complexity, and time to a life-saving project like that. Uh, we'd like to see some stronger language on safety in the bill that would allow some off-ramps to allow for a critical safety project like that. Um, absent uh, an exemption, some language to prioritize mitigation offsets for projects based on certain safety criteria should be added. The legislation last year created a working group to help implement the legislation and provide recommendations to the legislature. We support the creation of an oversight or advisory committee uh, that is in the bill currently, uh, uh, just to continue the very complicated work of the recently concluded working group to develop these impact assessment requirements, modeling tools, uh, and travel demand forecasts. And we appreciate allowing that committee to develop additional mitigation options. Um, it will be more difficult and less feasible to do some of the mitigation options specified in the current law uh, in greater Minnesota, which is why we support additional mitigation or offset options being added to the bill, uh, in addition to allowing the uh, oversight committee to 
propose additional. We'd like to see some more added to this bill. Uh, one of our con con uh, concerns with the introduced version of SF5099 is that by adding categories to a list of ap applicable projects, it expands the scope of the bill or expanded the scope of the bill without achieving the intent of the working group's recommendation of looking at a more programmatic approach rather than looking at this on a project by project basis. We think the author's amendment makes positive changes in a direction uh, to allow a little more flexibility for MnDOT to achieve the reduction targets. We think adding the word multimodal to the types of projects would provide some additional flexibility. We want to make sure that when we're assessing the impacts of uh, that we're assessing the impacts, we're counting the good with the bad. So in other words, projects that increase greenhouse gas emissions, but also those that decrease emissions, so we're capturing, so that we're capturing that and that the targets can be met. Uh, we'd like to see a city and county engineer on the oversight committee because uh, those are the people that are going to be doing the work. And we like uh, giving the commissioner the ability to identify capacity expansion project with the advice of the advisory committee. There could be some more language added to better define what qualifies as a capacity expansion project or what is what, what actually is a project that is adding capacity. Um, and we, finally, we strongly oppose uh, using trunk highway funds for mitigation purposes, which are clearly not trunk highway purposes and not constitutional. So we're, we were happy to see language referencing those mitigation or offset actions as trunk highway purposes taken out in the amendment. Uh, however, the appropriation section of the bill still takes 13.8 million from the trunk highway fund for other purposes, which we don't think is appropriate, particularly the 10 million for mitigation under section 161.178. Uh, we think there should be state funding provided for mitigation offsets that will be required, but we'd like to see that come from a different source. And I think, Mr. Chair, you have some creative ideas on how maybe to accomplish that, so we look forward to seeing that. Uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for incorporating some of our suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Questions, members? All right. Oh, thank Senator you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Lee, I was just curious, you, you mentioned a couple times, do you guys attend the working group meetings as, as the association? The uh, I attended the meetings, uh, sorry, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Lang. Uh, I did attend the meetings, I wasn't on the working group, but I attended uh, a lot of the meetings. And Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I guess the, the question is, is the working group, uh, is. It, Maybe just fill me in. Is, is that working group started and finished, or is it going to be ongoing as this process goes on? Uh, do they have ongoing recommendations? Have the recommendations been published? In uh, those Lee, are maybe uh, Mr. Lee things or that Senator the committee Marson. would like to see. Mr. Lee or Senator Marson? Yeah. Uh, so the working group, Mr. Chair, uh, so the working group has published recommendations, which uh, you can see, and I can get you a copy. Yeah. Uh, and I think the way the legislation was written last session uh, with the publication of their report that ends the working group. Um, so their work is completed. We will uh, distribute the report to the members and post it on the committee website attached as a part Perfect. of this hearing. Thanks. All right. Senator Howe. Oh, okay. Great. All right. I think that's it for Mr. Lee, you. unless you really want to hang out up there. Um, so we'll, we'll ask now if anyone else would like to testify in Senate File 5099. Seeing none, we'll take it back to the committee. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Senator Morrison, uh, it looks like looking at this now it, that uh, it applies also to the local road improvement program. And uh, it looks like they're going to have to be impacted and with additional mi mitigation requirements and the costs. Is, is that the intent? Is that they're looped into this too with the local road improvement program? Senator Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Howe, that yes, I mean, the, the idea is to look at all um, expansion programs, um, you know, and you've heard from the testifiers from a portfolio approach rather than a project by project approach. Uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So with that, I think the, the idea that uh, was just mentioned about having city and county engineers 
but I, the way it sounds, it would have been nice to have them on the, the working group, but it sounds like the working group uh, is over. Is that the way I understand that? Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Mr. Uh, Senator, how the working group has ended, they offered 11 recommendations. And I believe that city and county engineers were a part of that working group. Senator Howell. All right. Our members, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I had to step out for a second. So uh, thanks, Senator Morrison. When I first saw the bill, I obviously I was not a fan because I had some concerns about I voiced those last year. But thank you for the A1. I think that does relieve some of the concerns. Uh, first off, and I will start out, the leakages to me is, is a huge thing. We've, Senator Newman, we've been talking about this for, I think, eight years, about uh, taking general or trunk highway funds and using them for these type of purposes, and it's $13.8 million. So I have concerns over that. Um, I do like the portfolio uh, versus the project by project. As, as somebody mentioned, I think it was Mr. Lee, about Highway 14, you know, would this project have gotten done uh, if it had been after this? And, and I think most people say, from what I've talked to a lot of county engineers, a lot of city engineers, engineers in general, uh, said this Highway 14 expansion would not get done uh, based on vehicle miles traveled and things like that. And I will tell you, I voiced my concern over safety versus emissions uh, many, many times, and I've been to many funerals of people who were killed on Highway 14 before that project went through, and I will tell you, I've gotten hundreds of phone calls about the success of what the new Highway 14's done, uh, from ambulance drivers to you name it. We've gotten so many great comments. And so my concern is if what I'm hearing is if this would be implemented before, Highway 14 expansion would not have been approved. And I can tell you, again, by EMS drivers, uh, state patrol, uh, local officers, uh, this has made a huge impact on what happens in southern Minnesota. Uh, so I have concern over that, that and the economic reasons as well. Uh, you know, we're, we're transferring food, products, all kinds of things across our highways in southern Minnesota and northern Minnesota, not so much in the metro, but in rural Minnesota does have some definitely different road needs than the metro area does. Um, and, and neither are more important than the other, and don't get me wrong there, but it, there's different challenges in rural Minnesota than there is metro. And in metro, as Senator McEwen said, versus rural Minnesota, we don't have other options at a lot of times. So. I can't tow my boat out to the lake with a light rail, or I can't tow my boat with a bus, or things like that. There's a lot of things that we need to do in both business, recreational, farming that we can't do uh, that people in the metro can. So I have con some concerns over that. Um, I have concerns over the cost and the time of getting projects uh, approved. Uh, it's like we have this, um, it's like the Humphrey Institute versus the operational engineers at, at MnDOT and, and other people building roads of these conflicting things. I know we want to work together. I know we want to reduce those emissions, um, but we're going to electrifying cars and, and you know, are we doubling down with the, the vehicle miles travel is kind of probably biggest issue I have uh, because again, in rural Minnesota, it's a huge thing. And, and again, from what I've heard from engineers is the highway 14 expansion or the highway 23. There's, we have many, many projects. I think you even have one yourself that you came in talking about. And if this could limit that or reduce that or make it cost a lot more money, uh, that's our concerns, and, and so going back, uh, the leakages, I'll, I'll go back to. So uh, with that, I'd like to offer the A6 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A6, which is coming around. And while they're go ahead. delivering, I can explain. Basically, this would take, uh, instead of coming from the trunk highway fund, this would come from the general fund. I believe in the bill is about $13.8 million, uh, both for modeling and mitigation, I think, were the two different terms that we used. Um, so this would come from the general fund versus the trunk highway funds, because again, I believe those are constitutionally dedicated for roads and bridges. So I would off ask for your support of the A6. Senator Morrison to the A6. Uh, thank you, Senator, Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski. Uh, I am. I am interested in this idea, and I guess I would defer to the chair because I would like to see this get done, and he will ultimately have the final say. But um, I am I'm open to this concept. Do you have comments, Mr. Chair? Um, Senator Morrison, um, I would be in um, like s radical support of this amendment uh, <laughs> if we had a better target. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, uh, I have expressed to, to you and, and to Senator Jasinski and Mr. Lee and, and others that uh, I am skeptical of uh, funding all of these elements through the Trunk Highway Fund. I actually don't think it would even stand up to scrutiny if it were challenged uh, in front of the judicial branch. Um, I just don't think it stands up to constitutional muster. Um, so uh, I've been trying to think creatively about other approaches um, within uh, existing budget authority we have outside of you know our general fund target, which is two million one time. So um, pretty pretty slim, pretty skinny. Um, so you know where that leaves me on the eight six, I can't quite say, um, other than to say that um, I'm fairly sure. Um, that the A6 won't be what we see when we put together our omnibus uh, supplemental finance, um, nor will we see um, you know, section one as amended. Um, there will be something else that will, I mean, I, I'm committed to this bill. I'm very supportive, disagree with some of the analyses and, and perspectives that have been shared here. I don't want to necessarily get into all of that right now, but, um, uh, but the funding piece is a, a place where I think we could come together. So. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, the A6 could be adopted, um, and, that, and that would be fine as a, as a statement about how we feel about the Trunk Highway Fund mm -hmm. um, if the committee is open to continuing to work on other creative ways to find resources to support the aspirations of the bill. Senator Jasinski. With that, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate those comments, and with that, I'd, I'd ask for a roll call. All right, so, um, so Mr. Chair, Senator Morrison. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, with that conversation, I I would um, accept the A6 as a friendly amendment in a way to um, have a cleaner starting point for conversations, future conversations about this bill. Great, thank you. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll withdraw my roll call. All right, all right, all in favor. Let's try to speed up the meeting. All right, all in favor of the A6, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Members, anything further? Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. Mr. Chair, uh, I would like to offer the A3 amendment, and as that's getting distributed, I'll just let you know what it is. What it does is it actually uh, adds a county engineer and a city engineer to the advisory board. So... Pretty straightforward, but I'll, I want to wait for Senator Morrison to actually have a copy. I think we heard um, some articulations of this idea from testifiers. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Howe. Um, great idea, I agree, and I would urge a yes vote on the A3. Great, thanks. Anything further? All right, all in favor of the A3, say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Members, anything further on Senate File 5099? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If nobody else wants to speak, I could just, again, my concern, a big thing looking at the safety versus emissions. I know we all want to be carbon free at some point, uh, but to have emissions over do safety and some of those things are my concern with the bill. Again, I thank you for bringing forward and really thank you for the A1 because it does make it a much better bill. Um, but uh, obviously still have concerns, especially hearing from, from many, many engineers uh, that uh, again, going back to Highway 14, that if this, this uh, was in, in pl place at that time, Highway 14, what we saw got done would have never gotten done. And I've heard that from many people, many uh, engineers in the in uh, counties, cities, and uh, in the state that, that you know basically would say it would not have gotten done. And that's my concern because there's many, many more like Highway 14, Highway 23, Highway 212, Highway 7. I could go on and on. And many members here have a, have a project like that. And if these uh, requirements uh, are making that harder and more expensive and taking longer. Uh, we're just going to lose people in deaths and traffic accidents and things like that. Uh, so we need to make sure we find a balance of safety versus emissions. So thank you. Well, Senator Zinsky, um, I'm, I'm sure many have said it. I don't actually agree or believe it. It's easy to say things, but show us where in the language uh, a, a project like Highway 14 or Highway 23 can't get done. I don't, I think Senator Kraft, Senator Morrison have bent over backwards um, to accommodate issues 
of highway expansion, roadway expansion, where it's needed uh, for economic purposes and for safety purposes. And uh, I, you know, they have worked really, really, really hard to tend to those two specific uh, elements. Um, uh, so people can say a lot of things, show me in the language, you know, they've been a part of a working group to work on those specific questions. They're going to be a part of a continuing, ongoing implementation group. So, you know, if if we do, I'm, and I'm sincere, if we fall short, let's change the language because I think we share that concern. All right. With that, any uh, final words, Senator Morrison? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the conversation. Uh, I think this is an important step for us. I appreciate the concerns around safety. I share them. You remember I was here with several of my mayors for Highway 7. We have those same challenges. Um, and I think that the language um, addresses that, but I also heard from some of the testifiers today that they'd like to see it tightened up more, so I am open to that as we, as we go forward. But I appreciate the conversation. Thank you for hearing the bill. So with that, we will lay Senate File 5099 as amended on the table for possible inclusion in the upcoming uh, Senate Omnibus Supplemental Finance Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. All right. Uh, Senator Carlson, Senate File 4783. Senator Carlson, welcome to your committee. Senate File 4783, would you like to start with the A1 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an author's amendment. Senator Carlson offers the A1 amendment to Senate File 4783. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. The uh, A3 was a very simple amendment that just made a few small changes to the uh, language there and, and specifically called out the section of the uh, MUTCD, uh, the manual that uh, engineers follow to uh, uh, to set um, standards on uh, speed limits as well as other things that are related to transportation. Uh, the uh, the amendment um, requires MnDOT to implement the, that section uh, 2B.21 of that manual for the uh, Again, M-U-T-C-D, that's the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices for Streets and Highways, uh, at the 11th edition, as incorporated by the U.S. Department of Transportation pertaining to traffic engineering studies and investigations for establishing re and reevaluating speed limits within speed zones. This uh, bill actually, I think, uh, has come from a lot of inputs from a lot of different places, one of them being uh, actually a, a city in my district that wanted to change uh, the speed limit of the major highway that goes right directly through town. And uh, they were concerned that this, uh, this highway is, uh, uh, is posted too fast for their, their uh, town because there's a lot of pedestrians that are walking across it at all times because there's some uh, entertainment and uh, uh, you know, attractions that are in both sides of the highway. Uh, the uh, classically setting speed limits involved the measuring of the unfettered speeds that were uh, uh, that were existing in that area under study, and using something called the Solomon curve curve to uh, uh, compare the vehicle speeds. Uh, and assign an 85th percentile speed on a given road. Uh, and it needed to be within five miles per hour of that average 85, uh, 85th percentile speed, which uh, these days is moving up and up. Uh, so it's really something that's gone uh, obsolete, and that was actually based on something that was from the 1940s. So now the, uh, the new MUTCD uh, does have some additional criteria that needs to be considered when performing speed studies uh, with the intent of establishing speed zones outside of the statutory speed limits. And uh, it now uses uh, pedestrian activity, reporting crash experience, as well as median speeds of vehicles traveling on that roadway. Uh, it de-emphasizes that consideration of the 85th percentile speed. 
And uh, in my discussions with this, that's, I think it's a very good move because uh, we are all driving much, much faster than we used to drive, and uh, especially since 1940. So this is something that uh, it's time has come, and what we're doing is we're mandating that the uh, department use the updated, uh, uh, that they use the updated M. UTCD and correlate with as much as possible and conform to each new version in the future of the federal MUTCD, uh, this conforming process otherwise would take typically two years due to the length and density of the material in that, that uh, manual. And uh, the most recent updates to the MU MUTCD include a significant improvement in the speed limit policy. And that is covered in that section that is 2B.21. So I have uh, no one that has come out in opposition, but in support we have the Minnesota County Engineers Association has a letter that's in your packet. And also I have information that, that uh, documents that MnDOT is not opposed and supports this. And I have MnDOT, uh, have Mr. Eric Redeen here, if uh, you need to have any kind of conf confirmation from him. Great. Thank you, uh, Senator Carlson. Um, let me ask quickly, I think I spotted a kind of de minimis fiscal note, if Ms. Boyd can help us understand it. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Um, the fiscal note uh, only estimates the cost that would be needed to change the actual staff time of the work to change the language in the MUTCD. That's us estimated to be about four hours various staff time and is estimated to come out to the cost of about $1,000 one time. Right, I'm going to just write a check. <laughs> um, uh, would anyone like to testify on Senator Carlson's Senate File 4783? All right. Um, sorry, I hate to delay us, but I do want to invite Mr. Rudine forward, ask him a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess my first question, Mr. Rudine, is um, it was represented that uh, MnDOT is either a comfortable, neutral, or supportive of this change, if you could confirm that. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, again, Eric Rudine, MnDOT Government Affairs, and, and we worked uh, with uh, legislators, uh, including some from the other body <laughs> on this initiative, and yes, we're, we're comfortable and, and support um, this legislation, as Senator Carlson mentioned, it can take quite a while for us to update our state MUTCD to conform to the changes that have been made in the federal MUTCD. And so uh, this will allow us to use this specific uh, uh, change um, in the intervening time until such time as we get the state MUTCD updated. Great, thanks. And then my second question is, um, that's great. Glad to hear that. Um, do we think it's going to result in actual meaningful change in how MnDOT conducts its speed studies when those are requested? Because, of course, the frustration, as Senator Carlson uh, articulated, is um, sometimes uh, a jurisdiction will come in, ask for a speed study because they perceive that speeds are too fast in a particular area, representing a danger to other kinds of road users or, you know, other cars. Um, and, in fact, they end up with a faster uh, speed limit because of this, you know, what's it called? Solomon's curve or Solomon, <laughs> Solomonic decision. Uh, and the average is everyone's speeding. So, oh, we should increase the speed limit. Are we going to actually uh, factor in the more holistic uh, um, measures that the new, you know, the new enlightened MUTCD seems to want to take into account and get rid of this kind of old fashioned way of looking at speed limits? Yes, Mr. Chair, that, that is certainly uh, the intention that, uh, that when we're doing these speed investigations that we don't rely so heavily on, on the speed that traffic is traveling at that 85th percentile and instead look at, at uh, other factors such as, uh, you know, what is the pedestrian use in the area? Uh, what is the sort of local land use in the area? Is there a school nearby, for example? Um, so taking a broader approach uh, to, to some of those factors that go into setting a speed limit, because you're absolutely right. We've, we've had some of those instances where a community might want to lower the speed limit in a specific um, segment of, of roadway, but because of the speed 
uh, traffic is traveling that on occasion has resulted in an increased speed limit, which, um, which has really caused a lot of uh, consternation in some of those communities. So the hope is that by taking this more holistic approach, uh, we can prevent that from happening and actually set appropriate speed limits. Great. Music to my ears. All right. Anything further, Member Senator? Uh, just sure, speak. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Rudin. So, how do you think this will affect the speed limit on 35E between Shepherd Road and 11th Street? <laughs> I knew that was. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Senji would not let me go by that one without asking that question. So, uh, 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 just one comment. I think it was I read somewhere on the speed limits uh, for that Center of Transportation on MnDOT's website. Uh, it's actually speed limit study says lower speed limits don't actually reduce speed. It says that lower speed limits actually create a larger speed differential, and I think that's the dangerous portion is the speed differential. Is that not correct, or Mr. Rudin, could you comment on, on the differential versus the speed? Mr. Rudin. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Zinsky, uh, that, that can be correct, yes. If, if you simply just change a speed limit sign, that typically doesn't change people's behavior. It has to be um, a, a broader you know, education, enforcement, um, the the environment that people are driving in. So if it's a if it's a wide open roadway with nothing up close to the roadway, people for, feel more comfortable <coughs> traveling quickly. Uh, you know, if you have um, trees or other things closer to the roadway, then that sort of sends a signal to people that they shouldn't be driving as quickly. So it is it is a combination of all those things. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, our hope is that we would take all of that in context as we're doing these uh, speed investigations. So thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Rudin. So that there is some hope of getting the 45 up to 55 then maybe. <laughs> this is going to get us down to 35 on that stretch, Senator Jusinski. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I kind of want to jump on that bandwagon for just a split second. And, Everybody that was at that table was talking about lowering speed limits, lowering speed limits, and I think for ju just cause, right, uh, in communities in higher areas where we're, uh, but we also, we also have interstates in Minnesota. We also, most of the people in this room probably drive a car that isn't even 10 years old. We have crumple zones, we have airbags, we have Z-rated tires, we have anti-lock brakes, we have all these advancements in safety where on the interstate, I think we could do 80. I think we could do like other states do where uh, pick the pace up a little bit in a safe and manageable way. Um, does this movement, and it's it's hard telling by the bill, it really is only one page, uh, and it references a lot of other pages in text, I'm sure. <laughs> does that allow MnDOT to look at the interstates and say, when you come from South Dakota to Minnesota uh, and you have to slam on your brakes for 10 or 15 miles an hour or less, does that give you that ability as well? Senator Rudy, or Mr. Rudin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Lang. Um, so the, the authority that, that we're talking about in this legislation is actually for when we do a special speed investigation. Um, and so there are other speed limits set in statute that we, we refer to as statutory speed limits. And so, um, for example, that um, 70 mile an hour zone on, on rural interstates is, is set in statute, and so we wouldn't really use this authority to, to evaluate um, or change those speed limits. This is really more like on a, uh, a more local context where, you know, say you're coming in uh, on a two-lane trunk highway maybe in, into, into a town where, um, you know, before it maybe was farm fields and since, uh, you know, the um, speed limit was set, you know, 40, 50 years ago, you've had housing go in and a school and maybe businesses and so it's it's appropriate to do a an actual investigation there to see if the speed limit should be modified. Senator Lang. Oh, thank you Mr. Chair. So I don't know how I'd go from that. I, I guess the question is uh, do you have any capability? You don't have a capability at MnDOT to change the interstate speed limits at all? Um, Mr. Rudin. Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, we, we would if there was a special circumstance. And it would only um, go down. That, but probably it would be adjusted down. Okay. I, I don't think that we would necessarily have the authority to go above uh, a statutory speed limit um, without the legislature uh, adjusting that. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything further, members? Um, so with that, uh, final word, Senator Carlson. Actually, I think this is a good idea for a lot of 
small towns that uh, do want to do adjustments of their speed limits. Uh, we had, in my district, we had a uh, speed limit that was too high in one area, and uh, we had a young man get, or young uh, student get killed on that on that roadway. Uh, we, I have one of the s smallest cities around is Mendota, and that's the one that I referred to. We have the the uh, entertainment houses on one side, and we have restaurants on the other side. And the mayor is very concerned over the uh, speeds that uh, the that are on the the posted speeds on that roadway, which is Highway 13. So that uh, I think this is a good thing to do. And, and I have to say, Senator Lang, if you want to introduce a bill for increasing the speeds in the wide open spaces, I'll sign on to that. Well, you know, you tell your Senator electric Lang. vehicle, Mr. Chair, but. He tells his electric vehicle, because I know he owns a convertible, too, then, <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, just, uh, sorry, just, I guess this is not the final word. Sorry, Senator Carlson, to step on your final word, but Senator Jasinski, the point you uh, raise is a good one. Um, and, you know, it, was, it kind of reinforces what Mr. Rudine was talking about, and that people, um, I mean, posted speed limit is important, but the way a roadway is designed um, is, is, is probably sends a stronger signal. Um, to a driver how fast um, they can and or should drive. Um, and uh, a little disappointed that uh, some of the cities um, that took advantage of, you know, the freedom to set their own residential speed limits um, posted 25 on roads that are clearly designed for 35 and 40. It, it's almost impossible to drive 25 on a roadway that's designed for 35 or 40 miles an hour. Someone I'm related to might have gotten a speeding ticket on a road like that uh, in the last few months, and um, I later drove in the same stretch, and you know I was sympathetic. So that's uh, my message to municipalities who are lowering their speed limits all over the place to 25, but keeping everything really, really wide and wide open. Um, you're not going to get those 25 mile per hour speeds in those just because you have the, those two numbers on a sign. So. All right, but the MUTCD is supposed to be enlightened and deal with some of those other issues in other parts of that book. So hopefully we'll, uh, MnDOT will get to start adopting those elements of the, of the new manual. Senator and, Carlson. And Mr. Chair, we, we do have a, another bill that I, I'm carrying that is the photo cam for speed limits also. So uh, I think that you know, setting a fair speed limit also has its, uh, its enforcement issues coming up too. Great. Thank you. All right, that was the final word. Um, with that, um, we will lay Senate File 4783 as amended on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus finance supplemental bill. Okay, Thank so you, Mr. Chair. Senator Coleman, you get to round us out here. Starting with Senate File 4895. Welcome, Senator Coleman, to your committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I promise to keep this one brief. I know we got a bigger one up after this. Uh, just while I have you, if we're expressing support for increasing the speed on 35E, and just I vote in favor <laughs> of that. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Senate File 4895. Uh, this committee has committed itself to finding ways to make our driver testing and licensing systems as efficient as possible. While we have made progress in recent years, we know that Minnesotans seeking written and behind-the-wheel tests at DVS's testing stations throughout the state are still faced with long waits or long drives to accessing testing services. This idea comes to us from one of our local partners and would help take additional pressure off DVS's testing stations. Under current law, DVS partners with a number of authorized third-party proctors to provide the written knowledge exams. This system allows entities like deputy registrars, local governments, and nonprofits to collaborate actively with DVS to provide this essential service while taking pressure off our DVS-run testing stations. However, if an individual tech takes the test three times and fails to pass, current law forces that individual to take every subsequent test at a DVS-run testing station. This bill would eliminate that requirement so that our partners in the third-party proctor program can continue to provide efficient services to Minnesota residents. In your packets are letters of support from the Minnesota Deputy Registrars Association and the Wright County Board of Commissioners. And Mr. Chair, I do have one testifier. Thank you, uh, Senator Coleman. Before we go to your testifier, we'll ask um, Ms. Boyd to um, acquaint us with the fiscal note. Uh, Mr. Chair, 
Um, just so you're looking at the right fiscal note, it should say revised on the top. This was revised earlier today. Um, uh, so the bulk of it is on line or page two, just in the narrative explaining that, um, as Senator Coleman said, uh, fourth and subsequent tests, knowledge tests, are given only by DVS, and there's a $10 fee collected for those. So allowing third parties to conduct tests four and above would reduce that fee revenue collected by DVS. So that's what's represented um, in the fiscal note, a loss of approximately 112000 per year to the driver and vehicle services operating account, and then a small uh, programming cost of $8,000 to MinDrive to be absorbed by the department. Great. Thank you. All right. Questions about that, members? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Coleman, thanks for bringing this forward. I think this is a, a good uh, uh, bill. Uh, I just got to tell one story. So a lot of it is stress for some of these kids taking uh, the mm -hmm. tests. And, and uh, I have two kids, a boy and a girl, and my son Sam passed the exam on the first time, no problem. And he failed the, the, dri the driver's portion three times, and he was so stressed out. And so when my daughter came, JC came to take the test, I thought she was gonna have a huge issue with the driving test. She failed the exam two times and on the third time and she was just so stressed out about going in to, to take the test and those things. And I'm sure for people that uh, actually have to go to, to St. Paul or DVS, it would be worse on your third time or, or after your third time. And then when she actually take, taken the portion behind the wheel, I was really nervous about she passed in the first time. So it's kind of ironic how those things, but I think this is a good bill and thank you, Senator. Coleman for bringing it forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and who do we have to testify? Please uh, welcome and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed Hello. with your testimony. The chair and members of the committee, my name is Jesse Gottich. I'm the licensed center supervisor at the Wright County License Center in Buffalo, Minnesota. Uh, thank you for hearing this today. Uh, just a quick couple notes. We have been, we're a deputy registrar and authorized third party proctor for the class D written exams. In 2023, we did administer over 4,000 exams. At our location, we pride ourselves on providing efficiency and a high level of customer service to Wright County residents and all those that use our center. We are just looking to help add some efficiency to the driver testing statewide. So currently, as already stated, this law that's written into place is just preventing us from being able to administer that fourth or subsequent test. Uh, one thing I do wanna note, in 2023, we did track the data and we turned away 182 test seekers in 2023 and we're already up to 73 test seekers in 2024 that we're just unable to assist and we have to put into that DVS system. Uh, unfortunately, their lack of appointment availability across the state requires people to either have long legs between testing or it requires them to drive further distances to get a sooner test. So uh, why not just let them test at that same location that they had success in or well, at least they know what they're going, going to. Um, and just additionally, our staff has also had some instances in which a tester has uh, successfully obtained their license, but then maybe through some reinstatement needs to retake that test but if they have failed three times previously, even though they obtained a license, because of this fourth and subsequent test rule, they still are forced to go to a DVS station for all future tests because that reset doesn't happen on their record. So once a test is taken, that record is noted uh, and that prevents us from being able to administer tests in reinstatement situations. And yeah, thank you for considering the legislation and uh, I stand for any questions if you need it to ask. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, questions, members? All right. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 4895? I'm going to sign in there quick. All right. Seeing none, we'll pull it back to the committee. Uh, questions, comments, or amendments, members? Oh, okay. Great. Um, final word, Senator Coleman. Um, no, Mr. Chair, just thank you for the time and consideration. I know this means a lot to a uh, particularly Wright County area and some of my constituents as well, so thank you. Thank you, Senator Coleman. All right, with that, we will lay Senate file number 4895 on the table for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Finance Supplemental Bill. All right, um, moving on to Senate file 5174. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am very excited to present this bill today. 
I would like to briefly uh, talk about why I got interested in lane filtering. And that is when the gentleman to my left here brought up the idea and I laughed at him <laughs> and said, are you out of your mind? And I have, again, as I stated at the ground lighting bill uh, hearing, I have never actually even ridden on a motorcycle, uh, but there are people that I care about that do. Uh, and there are constituents that I represent that do. And after noodling over the idea, keeping an open mind, looking at the data, and talking to people who actually do ride motorcycles, I am sitting here before you today as the chief author on this bill. So it's come a long way from day one. Um, Senate file 5174, it is not a new concept and has been introduced in the past. And I'm not going for brownie points here, but I believe our brilliant chair here was the chief author 10 years ago. There is data from states that have enacted lane filtering that shows that it can reduce traffic congestion, but more importantly, is more about the safety of motorcyclists in traffic. Various states have passed similar legislation, with California being the first in 2016, Hawaii in 18, Utah in 20, Montana in 21, Arizona in 2022, followed with Nevada government agencies currently in their rulemaking process. And just last Friday, Colorado's governor signed their version into law. There are several other states that are considering it. Lane filtering is essentially allowing motorcycles to pass in between cars during stop and go traffic. This is not about motorcycles recklessly driving at high speeds weaving in between cars. Speed limits are imposed on anyone who wishes to utilize this option. Again, it is not a requirement, but it is an option. As long as the motorcycle is not going more than 40 miles per hour and is not going more than 15 miles per hour over the speed of traffic, then a motorcycle would be permitted to move around the vehicle, vehicle either within the same lane or by, by going around the lanes if there are two or more parallel lanes. For example, if on 35E, when it's a 45 mile per hour speed limit, it's a, something that's a sticking point, <laughs> coming up to the Capitol, traffic is stalled and going five miles per hour, then the motorcycle can move around traffic so long as they're not going more than 20 miles per hour. In a study by the California Highway Patrol, lane filtering motorcyclists were injured much less frequently during any collisions. I think we can all agree that SUVs and trucks being built today are bigger and maybe safer for the passengers inside them. However, they are becoming increasingly more dangerous for motorcyclists. Lane filtering motorcyclists were equally likely to suffer neck injury compared with non-splitting motorcyclists. However, lane filtering riders were less likely to suffer head injuries, torso injuries, and extreme injuries, as well as fatal injuries. Some of you might think that this sounds dangerous. Frankly, riding motorcycles is dangerous, and it's getting more dangerous out there. We are not allowing motorcyclists to protect themselves from being in major accidents, getting rear-ended, or worse, from being killed. Motorcycles involved in an accident that would be a seemingly normal fender bender between cars can include extreme injuries, detrimental to drivers and riders, and even fatal. And we need to think about the extreme heat conditions. They don't have an air conditioner. We need to allow motorcyclists to continue moving and help them to stay cool. In fact, I had a constituent who was riding with his wife, I believe on 494, when she started to get heat stroke sitting in traffic. Avoiding heat-related injuries is important for riders as well as passengers. Motorcycles don't have bumpers or ways to protect themselves from distracted, impaired, or reckless drivers. Senate file 5174 is one step we can take to make our roads safer, less congested, and help people provide protection to motorcyclists and their passengers. And Mr. Chair, I almost forgot, I do have the A3 amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Coleman moves the A3 amendment. It's an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. So with that, are yes, we ready Mr. to... Yes, Mr. Chair, I have a number of testifiers. If you are all right with it, I'd like to start with Philip Stahlberger. Great. Welcome, Mr. Stahlberger. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. My name is Phil Stahlberger. Uh, currently today representing Minnesota Rider Academy, which is a private... Uh, educational institution uh, helping riders, 600 riders a year uh, be safer across Minnesota. And Jed Duncan, our uh, CEO, is here in the audience. Also representing Aerostitch, which is a 41-year-old manufacturer of motorcycle um, safety paraphernalia in Duluth, Minnesota. 
I also come before you as a personal motorcyclist, um, be involved in my local uh, motorcycle clubs, both at the state and national level. Um, yes, as Senator Coleman said, motorcycling is dangerous. Um, it's a dangerous activity. And as we were just talking about in previous discussions about driving faster, uh, vehicles getting bigger, um, I'm essentially a sitting duck in uh, stop and go traffic. Uh, to the point a year and a half ago, I was on uh, Cedar Avenue going north, going uh, west on 494, in stop and go traffic. Uh, I'm a firm believer in what we call in the motorcycle community is ATGAT, and I've been riding since I was 16. ATGAT stands for all the gear all the time. If you were to see me on the road, you probably wouldn't recognize me because I'd be in Kevlar, head to toe, helmet, gloves, etc. I believe that is one of the safest ways to avoid injury. However, uh, when I am sitting in traffic and my bike's in neutral and I have both feet on the ground, I point my wheel in the other direction of the bumper just in case um, things like what happened did happen. And that is getting rear-ended by a distracted driver going roughly 30 miles an hour. Um, my wife, who doesn't like to ride for the reasons I'm explaining, was on the back of my motorcycle. And she sustained um, a compound fracture of her, of her tibia, two broken bones in her fibula, three in her foot. Um, so the injuries are severe. I, my bike was totaled, was able to keep it up. And if it wasn't for the um, amazing uh, first responders and troopers on the, on the scene, it would, could have been even much worse given traffic was traveling so fast uh, on that freeway. So at the end of the day, um, this bill is about safety and it is about reducing congestion. It's about a number of different things. Um, again, as bigger vehicles are driving at faster speeds, more distracted drivers, um, I am a sitting duck on uh, Minnesota's freeways, and this bill will help um, prevent some of those injuries. Again, are there issues with safety? Absolutely. Um, but I'm taking every measure I can to be a safer rider. This allows us to be uh, safer as well. Happy to stay in for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stahlberger. Um, so I have some, uh, some names that have kind of come in um, through the interwebs. Um, so Senator Coleman, did you want to call on folks in the order sure. that you have them? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, next, I'd like to invite up, does Jed want to speak? Uh, Jed can, Duncan, yeah? Sure. Or does, are you representing him? I don't know. For brevity's sake, we can move on to the next one if you'd like. Sure. Um, then uh, Mr. Frank Ernst next, please. Mr. Ernst, please come to the table. Thanks. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, committee, my name is Frank Ernst. I come here today with over 60 years of riding experience, probably more than a half a million miles. And we've talked a little bit today about fast traffic. I want to talk about really slow traffic. Uh, anybody who's ridden a motorcycle will know that the most difficult thing to do with a motorcycle is to ride slow. It's harder to keep it balanced, upright, and you're constantly working. You're utilizing your clutch and your throttle. With that, you've got the heat of the surrounding vehicles, the heat of the highway. Um, my wife and I were in a situation, my wife rides her own motorcycle. We were in a situation a number of years back where we were caught in that very, very slow moving traffic. We were moving at about the pace of the person walking. That's more difficult than being stopped, going at that slow pace. We were caught in that for, I would estimate, an hour moving along with all of the traffic building and everything else. Um, we finally approached an exit, and as we made that exit, I looked over at my wife, and she looked very, very similar to a fire engine. She was bright red. She was starting to suffer from heat exhaustion. Fortunately for us, we were able to get off the highway and get into some air conditioning and get her hydrated, and she survived it pretty well. Uh, what this bill would do is in a situation like that, where you're in that slow traffic, it would allow us to safely move through the traffic, get to an exit, and potentially save them issues. So I would sure appreciate passage of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Ernst. Senator Coleman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, after Mr. Ernst, I have Jane Doyle listed. All right. Thanks, Frank. Get my pen. 
It's all right, Mr. Ernst, you're in my district, I can find you. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Doyle. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. All right, Chairman Dibble, Senator Coleman, uh, members of the Transportation Committee. I have a 79 Harley Lowrider, and anybody that knows those old bikes knows that I don't have an easy clutch. It's very, it can be very difficult on my hand if I have to do a lot of shifting or a lot of holding the clutch in in traffic. So if my hand gets too tired, I'm gonna drop the clutch, kill the bike in that traffic. Then I have to try to get it started again. Um, my bike is air-cooled and it can be difficult to restart. If it gets too hot, I have occasionally burnt up clutch plates sitting in the heat. So if my, if my bike breaks down while I'm in that traffic, I now have to get off the bike, walk it to the shoulder, and sit there and hope that it cools off so I can get it started. If I can't get it started, I have to make a phone call and have somebody with a trailer come through that traffic on the shoulder to pick me up. Um, I would really appreciate being able to get through that traffic safely and take an exit so that I don't have that issue and ruin my bike over traffic. Thank you. you All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Doyle. Uh, Senator Coleman. Um, Mr. Chair, that's all I have written down on my end. Uh, and I'll just note for the record, members, we do have <coughs> Lieutenant Colonel uh, Bogoyevic in the, in the audience to respond to questions. You might have gotten some contact from them about uh, some of their concerns. Uh, Senator Lang. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, one's, this one's a little more near and dear to my heart, uh, having rid motor, rode motorcycles for many years and uh, you know, averaging probably 30, 35,000 miles a year and a lot of tires I bought over the years. Um, there's, there's a phenomenon that I don't think anybody's mentioned yet, but you'll probably all nod your heads when I say it. And, uh, not only in stop and go traffic, but in general, as people tend to tailgate motorcycles. They tailgate motorcycles pretty, pretty horribly, and I don't know if it's just because of the size of the machine uh, or what it is, but I can tell you that I've probably been breaking the law for many years because I do lane split. I've lane splitted for a long time, and I've done it for safety reasons. <laughs> Uh, when I stop, I don't stop behind a car. I don't want to get squished between two vehicles. I always snuck off to the side. And if they're going to rear end somebody, they're going to rear end a, a car. Uh, not only that, but um, to be honest with you, I think it speeds the flow of traffic up a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> I can't tell you. I've been in accidents a few times on motorcycles, and, I, and I'll tell you, not once was it my fault. It was other traffic's fault. Um, it was a deer's fault one time, but uh, but all things being equal, I think this is a good bill. Um, I think it's maybe a little counterintuitive when you think about it, but at the end of the day, it probably is safer than uh, not doing it. Um, and honestly, it gives you uh, a little more leeway, and it gives maybe a little more motivation to get on a two-wheeled vehicle and get to work earlier. <laughs> Just saying. All right. All right, anything further? Senator Jasinski. Uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Coleman. And mm -hmm. I've voiced my a little bit of concern over it, but I've, I'm hearing some more and more uh, positive. Uh, but I have a utmost respect for the State Patrol and the Acting Colonel uh, Bajovic. If she could come up and just uh, comment on how she feels this would affect traffic safety uh, on the, as far as the State Patrol sees it, if she could. Lieutenant Colonel. Maybe her first testimony since she's been acting <laughs> colonel, so I don't know. Maybe it's one you'll remember, but uh, uh, thank you. Diving in with both feet. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Christina Bogoyevich, I'm serving as the Lieutenant Colonel Acting Chief of the State Patrol. Um, although neutral on this, there are some concerns that it could impact traffic safety. Um, one being that there is a limited motorcycle season in the state of Minnesota. So the motoring public is not used to seeing motorcycles year long. Um, so allowing this driving behavior, um, again, vehicles aren't used to seeing motorcycles and then add the lane splitting or I'm not sure how you refer to it, but <laughs> um, adding that to it could impact traffic safety. Um, another thing would be uh, just we've seen an increase in impatient drivers. And so when you're talking about um, trying to gain an inch in a vehicle, um, they are moving from lane to lane during rush hour traffic, not necessarily paying attention to what's moving in between them. 
Um, and so as a motorcycle would be moving in between them, um, if I know I spoke earlier, um, you know, a motorcycle might be paying attention to what's happening, but if that driver of the vehicle isn't paying attention, there's gonna be a collision and that could, again, impact traffic safety. Um, and we're already looking at a fail rate that's almost doubled already this year before we even get into the deadliest days of summer. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Just the reason I brought up is that I think when you're going from either through three lanes to two or two to one and you have those, you know, usually during construction, you watch what we call a zippering effect. And I just watch people get very frustrated about letting people go ahead and trying to block off. So this kind of brings that same thing to mind. If, if motorcycles are doing the same thing, are we going to see increased issues? But again, I, it just... I've noticed a lot when you're going from three lanes to two lanes of construction or whatever, people get a little irritated if someone gets ahead or if someone doesn't. And so that's my concern with the bill, uh, with it. Uh, but I, you know, I'm being more and more convinced it may be a good thing, but I still have those concerns uh, over that issue of, of, you know, okay, I'm driving a car, but the motorcycles get to go through faster. And are the cars watching for the motorcycles? Because they're not used to seeing that. I mean, I, I'm looking for a car in my rearview mirror. So when I do something, and, and motorcycles are tougher to see. So allowing them between the vehicles, it would be my concern. But thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think I have to add my story to, uh, to the other stories that have been told. I've, I've had my motorcycle endorsement for, uh, I think it's been 62 years, and uh, just renewed my driver's license, and I paid to have it on, put on there again. Uh, and I think uh, riding motorcycles are fun. You know, I've had several of them. Uh, haven't had one for quite a few years. My wife made me get rid of it. <laughs> uh, but I have a son and a daughter that live in California, so I do go out there quite often. Mm -hmm. And I see what happens out there. And I'm, I don't know if we can enforce the speed limits that we have in there, because uh, what I see out there is the uh, lane splitters going 50 or 60 miles faster than the, than the traffic. And so it's, uh, it is a concern of mine. Um, I did have my own personal uh, crash with a motorcycle on Highway 94 in Minneapolis once, and, and that was where the car didn't pay any attention that there was a motorcycle beside her, and uh, she ran into the side of me, and, and I managed to uh, uh, recover on the, uh, the shoulder next to the concrete barrier. Uh, and, you know, a few things like that, but I think this is, this is a matter of uh, entertainment to a, certain, to a certain degree, and I think that uh, it's actually getting safer on motorcycles now because a lot of cars have the indicators that show that there's something next to them. In the mirror, there's a light that goes on. So starting to see motorcycles is a lot more popular now. I think that motorcycles uh, generally are bigger now so that they're able to, you're able to see them, they're able to uh, operate the, the uh, signals uh, when you go over the proximity sensors. So there's a lot of things that I think have improved with motorcycles. And so even though there are things that uh, maybe I'm not totally comfortable with, especially when my son sent me the picture of his helmet after somebody hit him, and the helmet was broken apart. Uh, but I know that he had his head in it. So I think that, you know, people that are they're riding motorcycles are riding safer than they used to. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I support this, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, I was, I've been, I think I've had a motorcycle endorsement and I've been riding, I rode bike, I think my first time I bought a bike in the Philippines, brought it back and <laughs> rode it in uh, California for a number of years. And uh, having some back injuries, I actually quit. I kept my motorcycle endorsement, but I, I sold my motorcycle. I didn't have one. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, different from you, Senator Carlson, but my wife actually bought me a motorcycle for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, when I went through my motorcycle training out in California, it was a deal where I, there was a CHIPS, uh, California Highway Patrol motorcycle officer that gave me my instruction. And he said, there's two kinds of motorcycle riders. Those that have had to dump their motorcycle and had an accident and those that will. There's nothing in between. If you spend enough time on a bike, you're going to have an accident. Whether 
or not it's your fault is beside the point. And I will tell you that those lane changing people, uh, there was a woman in a black pickup today that almost got me in my car. So it really doesn't make any difference what you're riding. Uh, there's bad drivers out there. And if you are happen to be next to one, you're gonna feel, feel that. But uh, I asked uh, Senator Coleman to put me on as a co-author of the bill Done. because uh, <laughs> I did this when I was actually a rider out in California. I haven't done it here because it's illegal, but I look forward to the day that uh, we can actually do this again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. Members, anything further? Mr. Chair, I Senator. want to keep you on committee for your or on time for your caucus, All right. so we have no further questions. Great. Very good. So with that uh, final word, Senator Coleman. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really, truly appreciate the time today and for all of the testifiers. Uh, at the end of the day, the concerns about safety, the data shows that those concerns are maybe counterintuitive. And uh, Senator Lang, I think you said it right. This whole thing is counterintuitive. My initial reaction was, what are you thinking? What are you talking about? This is absolutely insane. Uh, but the more you learn about it, the more you talk to the riders, the more you study the data, the more it absolutely makes sense. And uh, there is a dual education portion of this. There will be uh, funds set aside for a PSA so that drivers know that this is coming, as well as after talking to Mr. Duncan, uh, motorcyclists will be trained and taught how to do this properly. Um, if you think it's scary, I ask yourself to put yourself in the shoes of the motorcyclists. And uh, I'm sick of coming up here saying I've never ridden one, so I've committed to learning this summer. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right, with that, uh, we will lay Senate File 5174 as amended on the table for possible inclusion in a future supplemental omnibus finance bill. Uh, and members, uh, we will be meeting again next Monday, and to wrap up our deadline week, we'll have a couple meetings, and then we'll put the bill together um, towards the end of the week. Senator Zinsky, look like you wanted to say something. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, or Mr. Chair, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, again, just want to thank you uh, for the committee and, and several of the authors uh, being able to actually work with us and get some amendments on that uh, uh, give us some input on the bills, and, and we really, truly appreciate that. Um, so uh, thank you, Senator Morrison, for your on your bill, uh, allowing us for some amendments. So we, we really do appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. With that, we are adjourned.